let's turn together to the book of Acts. Let's turn in our Bibles together to Acts chapter 21. Let me, as you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 21, and today we'll be starting in verse 27, I want to give a bit of a rapid fire, rapid fire review because we're picking up in the middle of the story. Paul is in Jerusalem, and if you've been tracking with us, you know that the Holy Spirit has been warning Paul that hardship and persecution are around the corner for him. So Paul is bracing himself for what is about to happen in the passage that we're going to read and study together today. And he's going to Jerusalem, led by the Spirit, with an incredibly strong sense of calling. Everyone around him tried to talk him out of going to Jerusalem, but he was so compelled by the Holy Spirit that he pushed through all of those red flags and marched into Jerusalem and he's there to give a report to the Jerusalem church on the Gentile outreach. And he's there to bring an offering from the Gentile churches to the Jerusalem Christians to help those that are struggling, to help those that can't buy enough food, that can't pay their bills, uh, that can't pay their medical expenses. So the Gentile churches in an act of goodwill have t taken up an offering, and Paul is delivering that offering. And we saw last week that he gave his report to the leaders of the Jerusalem church, led by James, and that they asked him, there had, they had, there was a meeting before the meeting, and they had already come up with a game plan to help Paul connect with Jews in Jerusalem, especially at this time, because this is the Feast of Pentecost, and Jerusalem was bursting at the seams with devoted Jewish pilgrims that are there to worship at the temple. So it's a volatile environment, and Paul had a reputation, and the Jerusalem leaders, the leaders of the Jerusalem church, they had they know what people are saying about the Apostle Paul. So they tell him, this is what we want you to do. Jump through these hoops in order to showcase your Jewishness, in order to prove that you aren't against the Jewish people. And so Paul jumps through the hoops for the sake of the gospel. Paul submits for the sake of the gospel at his own expense. And so this is where we pick up the story in Acts chapter 21, verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides... He has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed him kept shouting, Get rid of him! As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? 
Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Heavenly Father, may your Holy Spirit empower and illuminate your Holy Word so that it is powerful and relevant to every one of us today. Drive it into every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. The plan backfires. So James and the leaders of the Jerusalem church had this plan to preempt the attack. They had this plan that they had created to prevent the ambush. And yet we see in our passage today that even with the best intentions, sometimes our plans blow up in our faces. The plan seriously backfires. Rather than applaud Paul's devotion, and that's what the Jerusalem church, the leaders of the Jerusalem church were hoping for. They were hoping for these pilgrims to see the Apostle Paul at the temple in the midst of performing this Jewish ritual, this Jewish vow that is found in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. They were hoping that the people would see this and say that, the rumors must not be true. The rumors that we've heard about this guy, that he is against our people and he is against our customs and he is against our temple, here he is at the temple with the people doing the customs. They were hoping that Paul performing this ritual, this public religious ritual, would deconstruct the rumors and the reputation he had among the Jewish people. But that's not what happened. Rather than applaud his devotion, they ambush him at the temple. It's ironic that Paul is attempting to prove his commitment to the law, and he is accused of not being committed to the law. He is trying to showcase his Jewishness to the Jewish people in the most Jewish place on the planet, the temple in Jerusalem, and he is accused of not being committed to Jewish tradition. Jews from the province of Asia are the prosecutors here. They're the ones that are stirring up the crowd, and they are in town for the Feast of Pentecost. We don't have to go too far back in the book of Acts to encounter the province of Asia. Acts in multiple cities, but in Acts chapter 19, we find Paul and his team in Ephesus, which is in the province of Asia. There were thousands of pilgrims in Jerusalem. The city was bursting at the seam with pilgrims that are there to celebrate this feast. And everything is centered around the temple. The entire Old Covenant was centered around the temple. Jewish worship was centered around the temple. And Paul is there with these thousands of pilgrims at the epicenter of Jewish worship. And they make these sweeping accusations. Now, Paul had been in town for a number of days. He was there at the temple for the completion of his vow. So he'd been in town at least a week. And so we don't know if these Jews from the province of Asia had seen Paul in town and this was a, a planned ambush. Or perhaps they maybe saw him at the temple that day and it was more of a spontaneous outburst. We don't know. But we do know what the result was of these sweeping accusations. They started shouting, this is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people. And they don't offer specific examples. They don't offer specific testimony. There's these broad accusations. Everyone, everywhere. He is against us. They go on to accuse him of bringing Gentiles into the temple, which was strictly forbidden. Now, God gave his people the blueprint for the temple. They didn't create it. The leaders didn't have a brainstorming session and come up with the 
blueprint for the temple, the blueprint for the place of worship. God gave it to them, and they simply built what he designed. And in accordance with the design of God, in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, there was multiple layers to the temple. The very outer layer of the temple was called the court of the Gentiles. So all people could come and worship the God of Israel. This is important because from the very beginning, God had the Gentiles in mind. They couldn't go into the deeper parts of the temple yet. That, that would come with Jesus Christ in the new covenant where everyone had equal access to the presence of God. But in the old covenant, there was a part of the temple that was designed by God for foreigners to worship him. And by the way, this is where Jesus flipped over the tables because the Jews had appropriated that part of the temple for their own purposes. They had basically commandeered this part of the temple. And that's what made Jesus so mad. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, for all people. And you have made it into something other than that. You have made it into a place for criminals, a den of robbers. And that's where Jesus flipped over the tables and pushed people out. It was in the court of the Gentiles. I think that's part of the reason that he became so angry is that they had moved into this place that was designed by God for foreigners to come and worship him. But they accused... So you had the court of the Gentiles, then you had the court of the women, then you had the court of the men, then you had the court of the priest, and then at the very heart of the temple was the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. And so this was the epicenter of worship. And Jews would come from all over the world to worship God at the temple. According to Jews, there was no more sacred spot than the temple. God had an address uh, under the Old Covenant, and it was the temple. This was where the symbolic presence of God dwelled. This is where God lived in accordance with Jewish doctrine under the Old Covenant. And so when they accused Paul of bringing a Gentile beyond that barrier into parts of the temple that were forbidden for Gentiles, it was a very serious accusation. These Jews from the province of Asia, they knew that in making this accusation, it would likely lead to the Apostle Paul being killed. That was the, it was a death sentence. That's how seriously they took this. That's how committed they were to this place, to their faith. And yet the Jews from the province of Asia, their goal wasn't to serve God, but it was to attack Paul. And they accuse him of bringing a Gentile into the deeper parts of the temple. And verse 29 says that these people assumed, and I want you to underline that word, highlight that word, because they assumed that Paul had brought his Gentile friends into the forbidden parts of the temple. They assumed, which means they didn't see it. They saw Paul with his friend at Tim Hortons the day before. They saw Paul with his friends at a restaurant a few days before. They saw Paul with his friends at the mall a few days before. And then they saw him at the temple and bam! Damn. They issued a verdict and then looked for evidence. They assumed. They were basing their accusations upon assumptions and presuppositions and preconceived notions. And we need to be extremely careful in making accusations because one accusation can kill a person's reputation and seriously damage their future. The general accusations that are usually made are this person is abusive or this person is irresponsible or this person is unqualified or this person is selfish or this person is manipulative and the list goes on and on. And these are general accusations that have some serious consequences and we need to 
We need to examine the evidence before issuing a verdict. We need to see specific examples before jumping on the bandwagon, before canceling someone. To see if there's an ulterior motive. To look at the person making the accusations and say, is this person trustworthy? To look at the person that is being accused and say, let's let them defend themselves before we issue a verdict. They were looking for evidence after they had issued the verdict. And their verdict was based upon assumptions rather than evidence. The crowd got really worked up about partial truths and false information. They got really worked up over fake news, a false narrative that quickly picked up steam, and the Apostle Paul was radically canceled. This is a classic smear campaign. The accusation is in bold font on the front page, and the retraction, if it ever comes, is in small print on an obscure page. Here's one of the things we need to realize, especially as Christians, who are seekers of truth, who we should base everything we do upon the truth, is that things are seldom as they appear to be. There is usually more going on than meets the eye. There's always more going on than meets the eye. There are spiritual forces at work, and we need to have this biblical worldview that informs our opinions, our attitudes, and our actions where we know that there are invisible forces at work. We know that there, there are forces of good, forces that, that, that serve God. There are, there are angels and the Holy Spirit, and there are other forces that are trying to undermine the work of God. And things are seldom as they appear to be. Paul said that Paul, the same Paul that's being attacked in Acts chapter 21, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that Satan himself appears to humans as an angel of light and his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. And so things are seldom as they appear to be, which means there will be people holding this book, standing in a chapel or a sanctuary with stained glass, and they will, from a distance, look like they are serving God. But upon further examination, they are agents of the enemy. They are counterfeit Christians that have infiltrated the people of God to undermine the work of God. That's what's happening here in Acts chapter 21. So the Roman commander assumes that Paul had done something wrong. So rather than rebuking the crowd for beating Paul, he arrests Paul and he immediately asks him this question, what have you done? How does he know that Paul did anything? Because based upon an observation from a distance, it looks like Paul is the one in the wrong. It looks like based upon the, the numbers, right? There are a thousand people that are upset at one person. Therefore, the one person must be in the wrong. Things are seldom as they appear to be. There is always more to the story than what we're being told. There is usually ulterior motives at play. The accusers knew their crowd in Acts chapter 21. They are at the temple at a time of heightened religious devotion during the Feast of Pentecost, and they shouted things that they knew would trigger this specific crowd. The accusers were agents of the enemy that had infiltrated the crowd. They knew what would happen if they made these accusations in this particular place among these specific people. They knew that Paul would probably be attacked and killed, and that's what they wanted. They wanted to take him out permanently. This was not, bam, a slap on the wrist. This was not a strike one, here's a warning. Strike two, you're on probation. Strike three, you're done. This was, they were going straight for the kill shot. And in the heat of the moment, everyone believed the loudest voices. I really want you to lean in and get this, because this is incredibly relevant in our day and age where we are inundated with misinformation, where we are, there's, there are, there's all kinds of ulterior motives swirling around us, and we need to be discerning. In the heat of the moment, the vast majority of the people believe the loudest voices. 
the ones holding the microphone usually have the most power over the people. The ones holding the microphone are the ones that shape public opinion and public policy. Because we as human beings usually equate amplification with authority. Therefore, the media shapes popular opinion. So whoever controls the media has the power over the people. And social media shapes public opinion. So we need to ask the question, who is behind the curtain? Who is pushing the buttons? Who is pulling the streams? What is the end game here? What is the ulterior motive? Usually, lies are shouted while the truth is whispered. Verse 30 said, the whole city was aroused and people came running from all directions. Things escalated quickly and this turns into a riot. These are normal people. I don't want us to get the wrong idea about these people that they're all demon possessed. There are a handful of bad people characters in this mob. The ones that started it, the one that instigated it. There's a handful of people that are agents of the enemy that had infiltrated this, this place of worship. But the vast majority of this crowd are normal people. Remember now, they are in Jerusalem because they, they made the trip there to worship. They are devoted religious People, they are there as a way of expressing their faith to God. And they got caught up in something beyond their understanding. They just were going with the flow, assuming that other people had information they didn't have access to, assuming that people leading the charge knew what they were doing. Remember, these are people that are at the temple in Jerusalem to worship they were devoted, regular people that became pawns in an evil scheme to undermine the work of God. There was a riot back in Ephesus in chapter 19, in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, verse 32, is a great description of every mob. It says this, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. And so we have this tendency to react and to grab the torch and the pitchfork and to join the mob. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 21. There is chaos and confusion, and when the Roman commander shows up, he can't get a straight answer from anyone. One person shouting one thing, another person shouting another thing, and so he has to retreat and try to figure out what's really happening. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, that for God is not the author of confusion. So if you're ever in an environment where there is chaos and confusion, you, mean you need to immediately stop. Do not proceed any further into the confusion. You need to stop and ask the question and pray. Stop and pray for insight. Stop and pray for clarity. Stop and ask for the truth. Seek the truth. This is not the first time that a religious crowd had been bamboozled. On the contrary, it's human nature. It's predictable. It happens throughout scripture and it's happened throughout history and it's happening right now all over the world. It's called propaganda. It works. The animal that the Bible compares humanity to are sheep. God doesn't compare us to eagles or to lions. We aren't compared to dogs that are known as man's best friend and can be trained to do incredible things. We are compared by God through his word to sheep and sheep are easily led astray. We are sheep. Sheep have a strong instinct to follow the sheep in front of them. When one sheep decides to go somewhere, the rest of the flock follows even if it's a horrible decision. For example, sheep will fall, follow each other to slaughter. If one sheep jumps over a cliff, the others are likely to follow. Let me give you a real world example. There's a story I found from 2005 with the headline, 450 Turkish sheep jump to their deaths. It's a fascinating art article. Here's a couple of lines. 
First one sheep jumped to its death, then stunned Turkish shepherds who had left the herd to graze while they had breakfast, watched as nearly 1,500 others followed, each leaping off the same cliff. In the end, 450 dead animals lay on top of one another in a billowy white pile. Those who jumped later were only saved because the pile had gotten higher and the fall more cushioned. I want you to think about this. This is the animal that the Bible compares humanity to, and this is a real example of 1,500 sheep jumping off of a cliff. You would think that one sheep would have tapped the brakes at some point in this suicidal pro procession that one sheep would have tapped the brakes and said, hold up. I don't know if we're moving in the right direction. You would think that one sheep would have paused at the edge of the cliff and looked down before jumping and saw the bloodbath below and saw its, the, the, its dead friends and family below and said, no thanks. I'm not going to just jump off this cliff. But the traumatized shepherds watched helplessly from a distance as 1,500 sheep jumped off the same cliff. Humans have a strong, intrinsic herd instinct which can cause stampedes. This is what causes riots. This is mobs, the mob mentality. And in our day and age, social media mobs are common. Social media stampedes are what happens. This is what's happening in Acts chapter 21. It's a mob. It's a riot. It's a herd. It's a stampede. We see this in the crowds around the crucifixion of Jesus. Thousands of regular people, and they're there in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. They're there to worship God. These are regular, normal, decent folk. They're led astray by just a handful of leaders and end up participating in the most evil thing in history. Regular people that got caught up in something way beyond their understanding. They base their involvement upon very limited information from a small group of leaders and they end up shouting, crucify, crucify. They trusted the wrong people. They became pawns in somebody else's game. Jesus said this of the religious leaders. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Never blindly follow anyone. I don't care if it is a religious leader or a business leader or a political leader or a family leader. Never blindly follow anyone. Blind allegiance is always unwise. This scene in Acts 21 probably felt familiar to the Apostle Paul because he once participated in murdering someone in a similar way. He was once a zealous Jew attacking Christians, and now he is a Christian being attacked by zealous Jews. We find this back in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 58, listen to this. When the members of the Sanhedrin, which by the way were the most powerful, respected, educated religious leaders in the country... When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, Stephen said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him to death. Meanwhile, listen to this, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. There he is. There he is. Saul of Tarsus, who two chapters later in Acts chapter 9 would encounter Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he would become the Apostle Paul. So this scene in Acts chapter 21 probably felt familiar to the Apostle Paul, but only now he is on the other side of the mob. Only now he is the target of their religious rage. He goes from worshiping at the temple to being beaten to death. Things escalate very quickly. And just to be clear, 
they were in the process of killing him. Verse 31 says they were trying to kill him. If the military hadn't have showed up a few, if, if the military had showed up a few minutes later, it would have been too late. They are in the process of beating Paul to death. They're screaming and punching. And I want you to imagine the chaos and the confusion. There are thousands of people but only a handful have access to the Apostle Paul. And as they are punching and kicking and scratching and hitting, their, their assault, their attack is fueled by the rage of the thousands around them. They are viciously beating him. And they think they're doing the work of God by punishing someone that broke the law. They become the judge and the jury and have a 10-minute trial and issue a death sentence. The Roman commander saved Paul's life. Basically, the cop shows up. And the Roman military was on high alert. They had a police station right by the temple because they knew that this was the place where insurrections usually started. They knew, especially during the feast times, that there was a higher probability where emotions were running high, nationalism was running high, and so they were on high alert, and they responded quickly, and in doing so, saved the Apostle Paul's life. These soldiers charge into the chaos, and they beat back the mobs. The mob, the commander, had also received faulty intel. There's so much misinformation floating around. You have one group that are pointing at Paul and accusing him of being a heretic. You have this other group pointing at Paul and accusing him of being a terrorist. Look here in verse, um, in verse 38. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists? <laughs> you have all of this misinformation. The Jewish people are, are believing a false narrative. Uh, they are basing their actions upon preconceived notions and assumptions. And you have the Roman military that have received faulty intel. And they're basing their accusations upon presuppositions and assumptions. Aren't you a terrorist? Aren't you that Egyptian terrorist? Paul goes, no. No, you have the wrong guy. And the point is, we are all susceptible to being led astray, to being manipulated by partial truths. We all have a tendency to join the mob, usually a social media mob. We all have a tendency to create echo chambers where we cancel every voice that challenges our presuppositions. We need discernment to be able to see through the deception, to be able to sense when something isn't right, to see through the first layer and perceive what's really happening behind the curtain. The Bible calls Satan, the devil, the deceiver of the whole world. Satan is the deceiver. So he infiltrates the people of God in ways that require discernment to recognize what's really happening. We need to examine the evidence for ourselves before issuing a verdict. We need to be skepti skeptical of those with the most power that have with the, the, those with the most power we should have the most skepticism towards. We need to ask the hard questions. Don't get caught up in the mob. Don't jump on the bandwagon. Don't be a pawn in someone else's game. Refuse to be manipulated by social media algorithms. Refuse to be controlled by online trolls. A troll is internet slang for a person who intentionally tries to instigate conflict, hostility, or arguments in an online social community. Listen to this. I want you to listen closely to this because we've all been duped on some level. And to, uh, this article that I found, and again, fact check me. Mm -hmm. You need to always, you don't need to blindly gobble up everything I put on the table. You need to examine it for yourself, and we'll get to that in a minute. In 2019, listen to this, 19 of Facebook's top 20 pages for American Christians were run by Eastern European troll farms. 
The data shows the vast spread of Facebook misinformation is largely powered by coordinated efforts among foreign professionals working together to spread provocative content in North America. We are like sheep being herded by foreign shepherds. Don't be gullible. Don't be naive. Don't immediately gobble up whatever is put on your plate. Don't immediately hit that like button or hit that share button or hit that cancel button. We need to pause and dig a little deeper and see who is actually pushing the buttons behind the curtains and ask, do these people have my best interest at heart? And when it comes to the the mainstream media, when it comes to these social media platforms, the people behind the curtain are not Christians. These are not Christ followers that are developing these algorithms that are controlling our behavior. And we don't need to just jump off the cliff. We desperately need discernment. Perhaps in our day and age, more than any previous day and age, because of the technology that we have access to, that we can make an accusation online that can go viral and can assassinate someone's future opportunities. We need discernment to understand what's really happening. A biblical worldview. And here's the deal. Discernment is something we can develop through the study of Scripture. Discernment is like a muscle. If we do not use it, then it becomes weak. And too many Christians have flabby discernment. Too many Christians are jumping off the cliff just because the people in front of them jumped off the cliff. If we work a muscle it gradually becomes stronger, and the same thing is true of discernment. We have to intentionally develop it. And how do we develop it? Is we study Scripture to develop discernment. When we study Scripture, we construct spiritual guardrails that keep us from being deceived and drifting into the ditch. When we study God's Word, we become more and more familiar with the truth so that we can recognize the counterfeits. When we say something isn't adding up, when we encounter a partial truth, it should immediately cause flags to be raised in our hearts, in our spirit, in our minds, because we have downloaded the truth. And when the truth encounters a partial truth, when the truth encounters a lie, it becomes a guardrail, a filter. Paul writes about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and specifically mentions the gift of discernment in verse 10, calling it the discerning of spirits or distinguishing between spirits or the ability to discriminate in spiritual matters. Every Christian is called to have discernment. And that happens. It doesn't really happen automatically. We've been given the Holy Spirit, but it's through the Holy Spirit that we are able to read and understand the Holy Word And so the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and it begins to create this sense of discernment in our lives. But there are there is a specific spiritual gift that comes with extra insight and supernatural clarity. The gift of discernment. One commentator says that discernment functions the same way a healthy immune system protects the body by by identifying and combating illnesses. The body is at great risk without a healthy immune system, and the same is true for the body of Christ. It's discernment that is the immune system for the body of Christ. That's how we that's how we recognize the agents of the enemy, not if, but when they attempt to infiltrate the church. There are there should be people in our midst that sense when something isn't adding up. People that hesitate because something isn't quite right. People that can see through the scams and call out the manipulation. These are people that don't go with the flow. People that step out of the crowd and ask hard questions. People that challenge the official narrative. People that refuse to support something that is based on partial truth. Every Christian should have a healthy skepticism of people that are holding the microphones, to refuse to go with the flow, to be discerning, to be perceptive, to sift through the noise and search for the truth, and to respond. Here's the concluding challenge. 
to respond in accordance with our faith rather than react in accordance with the flesh. What we see in Acts chapter 21 is that the vast majority of the people reacted rather than responding. They reacted and they got sucked into the emotion of the moment. They got caught up in the current of the situation rather than stopping and asking the hard questions. We, as far as we know, of the thousands of people that were around this situation in Acts chapter 21, not one person stood up and said, Stop! This isn't right! Right? They, not, uh, only a handful were the perpetrators, and only a handful were the ones that had access to Paul that were actually physically um, beating him. But where, what about the others? You know, this is the sheep mentality, the herd mentality. Wasn't there one sheep in the herd that would say, I'm not going to jump until I see for myself, right? I need to verify the accusation before issuing a verdict. So all of us, as we, as we scroll through our social media feeds, we need to pause. We need to wait. Let the dust settle. Let the emotional dust settle before making a comment that could be based upon misinformation. How many bridges are being burned? How many bridges are being blown up? Not because of truth, but because of false information, misinformation, fake news. And Christians should be the least gullible people on the planet because we have the spirit of truth living in us. And we have the only source of objective truth, the word of God, that we are basing our lives on. We need to be so familiar with the truth that we immediately recognize the counterfeit. And we need to be so filled with the Spirit that we, the Spirit is the emergency break before we go off the cliff, before we are so enraged that we aren't thinking clearly. And we cancel people and we, we share accusations that go viral to respond as a person of faith rather than react in the flesh. But the first thing is you must have the spirit. In order to have spiritual discernment, the essential prerequisite is the spirit. And some of you have yet to invite the spirit into your life. Some of you are on the outside looking in. And so the only way that we can accurately develop the spiritual muscle of discernment is through study of Scripture. And the only way we can study the Scripture, the only way we can effectively study the Word of God is through the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that illuminates the Word of God. It's the Spirit of God that brings understanding to the Word of God. So some of you today need to make that decision to invite Jesus into your life. And in doing so, you will receive his spirit. And that is step one when it comes to not being a pawn. That is step one when it comes to not being manipulated. That is step one when it comes to not following the herd over whatever cliff. And it's not complicated. Jesus said, in the same way that a human father gives good gifts to his children, how much more will your, will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? So a child, as a child approaches a parent with open hands and a trusting heart, that's how we should approach our heavenly father. With open hands, which means we have to let go of whatever we've been holding on to, and we reach towards Jesus with a trusting heart, with that childlike faith, and ask him to come into your life, to forgive you of your sins, and to be with you forever.